Do you, do you Are want you to gonna do the introductions, Marco, or should uh, I? I just wanted to, to just introduce our two guest critics to the committee and then you can do the formal okay. introductions. But uh, uh, Tamara Zinger joins us, I, I'm assuming from New York, you're at the exactly. Cooper Union. Exactly, I'm in New York City, yeah. Yeah, in New York City, um, teaching at the Cooper Union and um, uh, has quite a bit of, of expertise uh, in this research area of architecture and play. I don't, I don't know where that terrible noise is coming from. Uh, it's right outside my door. They seem to be doing some landscaping. I see. Okay. Well, I it, guess once it, we get started, you, you can go on, on mute. And and our second external critic is Sarah Gelbard, who is a uh, PhD candidate at McGill um, in uh, urban uh, uh, planning. Um, so Colin is our program representative, so he will take over the role of sort of master of ceremonies. Um, and so I'll turn it over to you, Colin, and hopefully we can get past this horrible noise that's just outside your window. <laughs> it, it, they should be, it's just the, the leaf, leaf blower, he'll be done in Oh, moment. okay, okay. Um, so essential, essential service. That's right, that's right. It's actually, it's actually nice to have a noise in the, in the background. We feel like much more at home this way, right? Like, right, yeah, the, world, the world continues. The connection yeah. to the outside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's right. If we this were sitting course... at school, there will be so much noise and so much interruption. That just feels like a little bit more natural. Yeah, there's always uh, there's always sirens screaming past uh, our building. <laughs> okay, are you also you're all in Toronto, yeah? Uh, Sarah is in Ottawa. Otherwise, the rest of us are in Toronto. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It so, looks like he's Colin. he's moved on to to uh, the next spot. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, uh, I want to um, uh, welcome you all to RP Katrijan's, um final thesis defense. How's that feel, RP, to be at a final defense? Nervous. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll start by, by setting, setting the ground rules and then I'll introduce our committee and we'll move from there. So RP, as you know, you'll get about 20 minutes to present. I won't particularly time it and I won't tell you if you've gone over because I know by now you've done it over and over. Uh, and then we'll take about 40 minutes after that for a discussion, which will normally kind of start with questions, uh, questions of clarification, and we'll lead seamlessly into commentary whenever we feel we're ready to do that. And after about 40 minutes of that, the committee will, will ask RP to leave, we'll stop live streaming, and we'll be in, in, uh, in, in, camera, <laughs> in camera for a few minutes. So the committee uh, begin with- uh, uh, Colin, just before you go further, after you leave, uh, I will later on contact you. Yes, of uh, course. And we'll, always, we'll have another Zoom meeting, private one, to discuss the outcome of the discussion. Sorry, Colin, it just so okay. we don't forget to tell the story. So the committee today, we have uh, Masha Etkind as supervisor. Uh, Scott Sorley is second reader, and I'm here as program rep. And of course, Marco Polo, the associate chair for, for the MARC programs, is also here with us. We also have two uh, wonderful um, external critics, and I'm very happy to have them on board. Uh, Tamar Zinger, am I pronouncing that right? Correct, that's right. Okay, and Sarah Gelbard. So uh, Dr. Tamar Zinger received her professional degree from the Cooper Union in 1989. I'm sorry for the dates, but this is right from your website, Tamar. Okay. <laughs> uh, her MSc in architecture from Technion in 1998 and her PhD from Princeton University School of Architecture in 2006. She's practiced architecture in Israel and the United States and currently teaches at the Cooper Union. Her book, Architecture in Play, Intimations of Modernism in Architectural Toys was published by the University of Virginia Press in 2015. Sarah Galbard is part punk planner, part an architect. Her work looks at both how we shape our cities and how our cities shape us. She's a graduate of the Israeli School of Architecture at Carleton University and is currently working on her PhD in the School of Urban Planning at McGill. Her dissertation, Who Builds Whose City? Alternative Traditions of Transgressive City-Making Tactics, aims to understand the outsider and non-sanctioned spatial practices of marginalized and alternative groups that are often overlooked by 
and remain invisible within the histories and theories of urban planning. So this sounds great. So Arpi, are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Arpi Katarjan, and I'll be presenting my thesis titled Architecture of Play, Levels of Transformation. This thesis explores an architecture that actively takes part in the process of play through a sequence of experiential spaces named levels that transforms an individual from their everyday to their escape. Level one, play. This work uses play's ability to allow for an escape. Play reveals its absorptive characteristics as it immerses the subject intensely in an otherworldly mindset. We feel this intensity when we lose ourselves while taking chances, while playing a competitive sport, or acting a role in theater. In the histories, Herodotus writes about a famine in Lydia that lasted for 18 years. In order to survive the famine, the Lydians escaped their struggles by playing with dice and ball to distract themselves from hunger. Happy? Yes? I, I don't know about the rest of the uh, members, but all I see is you presenting and the screen is minimized. Does everybody see RP's shared screen? Yeah, I, I have the shared screen. I'm seeing the presentation. I can, I can see it as well. Um, okay, so it's me. Okay. Yes, I see it fine. Now I do. Okay, sorry okay. about that. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Okay. All good. So what is play? Taking play theorists Johan Huizinga's and Roger Calwa's definitions, play contributes to culture and is a voluntary activity standing outside ordinary life in an alternate time and space. It is governed by order and its outcome is uncertain. Most importantly, play consumes time and energy for no monetary or material gain. Zinga's definition separates work from play, where play is seen as unprofitable, unlike work. However, our work and play all that different. As children, play helped with our development. As we grew, however, the Western stigma that adults do not play was ingrained in us. We find ourselves separating work from play, though both take as much mental and physical exertion. The separation society has created is evident in the form of reward. Work being the method of achieving material rewards and play being the act that gives us immaterial rewards like joy, happiness, escape. We find ourselves disregarding the importance of the immaterial due to our shortage of time. Level two, play then and now. The avant-garde revolutionaries called the Situationist International used play against the contemporary city of the late 1950s. They tried to remove the separation between work and play and strive to make them one. They had two main objectives. First, they wished to transform the experiential nature of the modern city from one of boredom to one of play. Second, they aimed to restructure modern aesthetic experience by rejecting functionalism. Today, to be more accurate, pre-COVID-19, one could argue that our physical city is not one of boredom. 24-hour shopping, multiplex cinemas, and other possibilities are available to entertain us day and night. There's an ongoing stream of information, impulses, and encouragements for active consumption. With the rise of mobile technology, the nine to five time slot is removed. We can work anywhere, anytime, with corporate companies paying for employees' phone bills, food while providing fun spaces. Employees are drawn to work all the time. As a result, contemporary architecture uses play to disguise its socioeconomic agenda. While it appears to be spontaneous, fantastical, and free, it creates an artificial escape while promoting work. Like the situation is intended, this this. this style steers away from modernism's rigidity and explicit functionalism, but as Douglas Spencer claims, it has become an instrument for control and compliance. 
The situationist idea of play is quite different from the current idea of passive entertainment. Their play strive for true spontaneity. Level three, the architecture of play. As research and design progressed, a set of rules emerged that distinguishes the architecture of play from the architecture of distractions. To start, architecture of play draws from infinite games. According to James Karst, there are two kinds of games, finite and infinite. Architecture that allows for a finite game is one where the user follows the rules of the architect. These spaces are static. These games, for infinite games, these games are flexible tools that allow for dialogue between the architecture and the user, allowing for different types of play. The following are the eight rules that define the architecture of play as it relates to infinite games. I'll be going through each one of them one by one. Number one, the architecture of play is designed with degrees of freedom to accommodate for motion. These degrees of freedom provide spatial flexibility. Here, the architect designs ranges of movements and the user manipulates the architecture within the provided extents. Play is a process. Engaging in that process is what contributes to the escape from our everyday. When competing through chess or solving a puzzle, we tend to engage with playthings by manipulating them. While riding on a roller coaster, we lose controls of our, control of our bodies to the motion of the vehicle. Hence, Movement of the object, whether we move it or it moves us, is an essential element in the process of playing. Home Palace is an example of a proposal that allowed for flexibility. Inspired by the rise of new technology in the 1960s, this palace was designed to be a laboratory that would adjust to different artistic functions needed by its users. Although flexible, it is important to note that flexibility provided within the architecture of play is not designed for practical purposes, but no purpose at all. Sometimes the degrees of freedom are designed to conflict intentionally. Number two, the architecture of play is manipulated by people and not by a pre-programmed method. The focus is on the act of play. Therefore, the user transfers energy through the architecture itself, resulting in a legible cause and effect relationship. Number three, the architecture of play is categorized by its degrees of freedom as opposed to types of play. As design research progressed, it became challenging to categorize architecture of play by types of play. Casinos, as a typology, are categorized specifically under games of chance. Theaters are spaces that fall under imaginary forms of play, like acting, dancing. In the architecture of play, users can have various reasons to engage with the architecture and it may be a combination of those types. Instead, the architecture of play can be categorized by its flexibility. Between one to six degrees of freedom, the architecture lies within two extremes, restricted and unrestricted movement. With restricted motion, the architect can limit users from adding constraints, and for unrestricted motion, users can insert additional invisible restrictions. Number four, in the architecture of play, the architect can highlight the intervals of the provided degrees of freedom to allow for more interpretations. These intervals are spatial. For example, it would be difficult to play chess on a board of no eight by eight grid. The movement of the pieces is dependent on the grid. The grid allows users, players, to insert rules and restrictions of movement. Same goes for roulette. The intervals allow for gamble. Number five, the architecture of play is composed of abstract and practical geometries as opposed to familiar architectural elements. Bernard Schumi used geometries as opposed to architectural elements for his follies in Parc de la Villette in Paris. This way, the architectural experience is less prescribed. Even though Schumi's follies reject program and functionality, the dialogue is cut short to, due to the folly's static nature. Number six, most boundaries that separate the play world from the ordinary are legible defined geometries, such that there's no confusion between players regarding limits. 
This is why we often find spaces of play like courts and stages are of simple graspable geometries like rectangle, diamond, circle. Number seven, the architecture of play is based on geometrical order or logic. This order makes it easier for users to understand the mechanics of the architecture. For game theorist, Jane McGonagall, good games are often ones that you do not need to read the instructions. Inhabitants are more likely to comprehend an institution in which the architectural language is intuitive and legible. Number eight, architecture of play has aesthetics that contribute to playing games. The escape is achieved through engagement with the architecture and not by its fantastical or col colorful appearance. The appearance entices play only as a secondary layer. Instead, architecture of play highlights identifying characteristics of forms aesthetically to provide more readings. For example, a dice is a cube with six distinct surfaces. If the surfaces were all the same, it would be difficult to use it as a gambling tool. Here in architecture, materials, textures, formal differentiation can contribute to gameplay. These eight rules are applied to the following design projects. Level four, serious fun. The rules were established over time through various methods of research. Painting was used as a medium of exploration due to its ability to be expressive. It also served as my personal means to escape and play during stressful times. Collecting is seen as a type of play as well. Playthings like puzzles, toys, props were collected to inform where the play element is found in architecture. Model making allowed to explore movement and mechanics considering the importance of flexibility in the act of play. Level five, preliminary proposal. The first painting is an elaborate party of these thesis explorations. It is representative of three parts. The first half is the everyday world we live in. The second is the alternate fantasy. And the third is the rabbit hole that serves as a portal from one to the other. The idea was to pro provide the escape in the underground. This way, the physical boundary between the everyday and the experience of the architecture is distinct. The site chosen is the underground path system of Toronto. The path is already a game in itself. It is a maze that traps its inhabitants. This thesis speculates a scenario where the path becomes the true escape for the individuals of the Toronto's downtown. The portion of the path selected for this thesis is the underground concourse of the Toronto D Dominion Centre. Architect Mies van der Rohe's concourse is helpful towards the discussion of work and play in architecture considering his modernist philosophy, less is more. Since the situation as play has been a critique of functionalism in architecture. This thesis began by enhancing play in five moments found in the concourse. Mises provided grid becomes essential as it serves as ready-made intervals for the proposed play spaces. The interventions in this proposals in this proposal were fitted into pre-existing dimensions of the path within the TD concourse. The final design breaks away from the pragmatics of site and takes a more speculative approach and attempt to push the discourse further. Also, in this proposal, the eight rules were applied rigorously to prove them better. For example, regarding rule eight, the entirety of the proposal was presented in grayscale. As a consequence, the renderings did not seem to entice play, even though they proved that play is not colorful. The final design reinserts color and fantasy back into the interventions, but only as a secondary, less critical layer to entice play. Level six, final design. The final design emerged through the reflections of the prelim preliminary proposal, through the implementation of eight design rules that were explained. This, the following is only one of many ways of achieving the architecture of play. The proposed is a speculative architectural design that actively takes part in the process of play, such that users are reminded of its importance and ability to provide pleasure. This was achieved through a composition of series called levels of transformation that is sequenced to transform an individual from the everyday to their escape. 
First, the sequence traps the individual, then disorients them to be able to reorient them. Eventually, the architecture entices the individual, leading to their mental escape. They begin to play as they rewind towards their exit to their everyday. Each, of, each individual experience through the series is different and contributes to the ongoing discourse of work, play, and time. For those who are chasing time and focusing on the end destination, the architecture can be perceived as inconvenient and frustrating. For those who are players, wanderers, the architecture is seen as pleasurable. The strategy of the sequence applies, applied transforms those who are frustrated to eventually come to terms with their surroundings, leading to their escape. After, after individuals re reach their mental escape, they self-reflect through a rewind. Moving forward from the preliminary proposal, the concourse was looked at as a portion of a larger network as opposed to fragments. Here, the sequence is translated in plan under the TD concourse, such that level one is closest to the entrances and exits. Level two and level three follow as individuals fall deeper into the system. This way, individuals are guaranteed to go through a rewind from any entrance to whichever exit. The method of arrangement created overlaps between those who have transformed and those who have not. In the architecture of play, the individuals and the architecture are in dialogue, and so are the individuals of different mindsets. The project uses the highlighted fragment of the concourse. Based on the proposed sequence, the overall journey of transformation is presented under the TD concourse with plans and sections of the three levels. This drawing showcases the overall organization and layers of complexity of the proposed system. The unusual entrances are designed to attract curiosity. The first level of transformation is a maze-like environment that traps the individuals that are caught in the unfamiliar situation. The level is designed such that users lock themselves in as they manipulate the flexible mesh walls. The mesh is held by poles that are grounded in sand. The sand allows for users to change their elevation, allowing them to reach openings of different heights. Users are also able to discover new perceptions of the space by manipulating the placement, brightness, and color of the provided light column. <laughs> Screens that can be rotated are tinted differently than others. The space is enclosed in a recognizable domed volume and has identified intervals through a grid. Individuals that are chasing time strive to get through the maze as quickly as possible, making the minimum moves to get out. It is assumed that they would find the sand to be of utmost inconvenience and would not bother manipulating it. Whereas those who are players would manipulate the space, including the topography for different perceptions and arrangements. A dialogue happens between the users of different mindsets. Those that are players change the course of the maze and the overall space. Their play would clash with those who want the most convenient arrangement. The second level of transformation disorients the individual. Here, individuals lose track of time, space, and location. They begin to question themselves as they are caught in an unusual space. The space <clears throat> is filled with water in which a spherical floating balloon is inserted. What seems to be a wall can also be a ceiling and a floor. This balloon can be rotated in all directions. Here, users can experience the space in numerous orientations. The spherical boundary has identified intervals through a radio grid. The inscribed balloon is composed of three different tints. Each tint identifies parallel planes. The material itself, being an inflatable, acts as a more engaging material as it is less rigid. The sphere is composed of straight stair-like geometries with no practical scale, orientation, or purpose. The hasty will find themselves trying to pedal the balloon towards one of the ports. To them, the sphere acts as a boat. At this stage, it is assumed that the users who are chasing time will reach their peak frustration. 
On the other hand, the players will be rotating the space to discover new perceptions with no end destination in mind. The dialogue happens between the users of different mindsets. The players designed to move the sphere according to their explorations without caring to reach any of the four ports. Their play would clash with those who want to get to a port as quick as possible. The third level of transformation attempts to entice the frustrated users to come to terms with their new reality and give in to the act of play. They find themselves surrounded by a tensile mesh that is controllable through adjustable, that's controlled through adjustable hydraulic pistons. This phase is almost like a testing phase as it does not require engagement with the pistons. Still, the tensile mesh being a malleable material makes it difficult to rush through the level. This stage has higher flexibility in terms of components. Users can manipulate shape, scale, brightness, and color. The cuboid boundary and the tensile mesh have identified intervals through a grid. Here, the frustrated individuals are enticed to find the light in their surrounding, leading to their mental escape. Those that are players manipulate the topography and the expansiveness of the space. After this stage, the individuals begin their rewind. The rewind allows individuals to self-reflect. They feel familiar to the spaces as they pass through the levels the second time. Here, they have reached their mental escape. Time and space take on a new definition and they become players. Eventually, they exit and find themselves back to their everyday, refreshed and reoriented. Level seven, end level. Play is everywhere. We often overlook obstacles found in our daily environment. Something as simple as a revolving door can be used as a tool for limitless playing games. The architecture of play helps expose active play through a series of architectural obstacles in two iterations. First, by enhancing the pre-existing obstacles that are present in the path system. Then through a speculative approach, through which each individual's experience contributes to the ongoing discourse of work, play, and time. Thank you. Thank you, RP. Uh, so we start our discussion now with any questions of clarification from the critics. First of all, congratulations. I think it's very beautiful work. Uh, and uh, we'll say more about that, but I, I want to first ask a question about your um, process. Uh, did you create the work in the order that you presented? Or, I mean, I'm, I was just very curious as I was reading it and as I was listening to you now, if the first uh, more theoretical uh, aspects of play and the research came before the design and the creative work that came later, or, or actually the latter part preceded it. In terms of your process, how did, how, how did you work? Um, the research began by, what happened was I tried to define play in a theoretical sense. Mm -hmm. um, eventually tried to translate play into architecture, uh, which became a struggle. And then eventually uh, it led to the, the way I was able to come up with the eight rules was to begin with the preliminary proposal. And that was the big first step that I took mm -hmm. in terms of process. Mm -hmm. And then eventually as more design um, research progressed, I was able to mini um, re go back to those eight rules and adjust them over and over again I understand. to make them more concise, yes. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, absolutely. I think, uh, I think that's probably a very good uh, decision. And I think um, I was wondering as I was reading, because it's presented uh, first in your work, as I was reading those rules and the theoretical concept, I was wondering how you managed to extract them. So I think now I understand uh, that it came from your, uh, um, um, from your design. Uh, I, I also thought it was a really very good decision 
to choose the path system and uh, and those corridors. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with all of it. I just remember very clearly one part of it. I think, tell me if it's the one, just so I know if I, or I'm orienting myself correctly. I know the underground that the whole Trenfer, right? There's a, there's a department store that goes, it connects to that underground. Is that right? Yes, or am does. I not? That's yeah, cool. yes, it does. Yes, it, it does. does. So I remember very clearly that one part, which is, I suppose, one of those areas. I haven't explored all the branches, but I, so I have a pretty good imagination. I feel that intuitively it's a really good place to have chosen your intervention. Um, and I, but I'd like to know a little more from you why, if you can say again, I remember reading partly about that, but if you can reiterate why you chose that as a site for play. Um, well, it started with the, um, it started with looking at the underground as um, a site overall, as an abstract method. Um, considering that the underground includes network of commute. And the idea was to present architecture of play within in between spaces being the, the commute, which is why the original uh, site selection was the subway, the subway system as a whole and subway stations. Uh, eventually through um, various stages and criticisms, we went through the path as a more um, graspable site, also considering the fact that it already is like a maze and it uh, took, um, I found it appropriate to be able to try to insert the whole research of finite and infinite games into the path system itself mm -hmm. uh, to see how that play would, how would, how that would play out. I have some comments about that. Should I keep them for later? Or are we at the stage of the questions or should I already continue? Well, uh, um, I'm wondering if anybody else has urgent questions before we go into a commentary. Sarah, are you okay? No, I'm good to move into the commentary. Okay, Scott? I'm fine. Okay, okay. so who would like to start us off? Well, Sarah? if I can just maybe okay. continue just uh, because it relates to my question about the movement and then I'll, I'll shut up. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, your choice of the subway is really very interesting. Uh, first, like you said, first it's a space of movement and I, it's amazing how movement is really very much related to play. Mm -hmm. uh, bodily movement, vision. Uh, I mean, it's very hard to differentiate, distinguish, take apart movement from play, especially when it's about our, uh, our own play. So I think that is a really great uh, decision. And there was a moment um, that you talk also about some, like uh, whatever is below our ground as hell. You know, and I was reminded, no, it's, I think it's a really good distinguish, you know, and you talk this, the way you distinguish between are people going to enjoy this or are they, are they going to feel trapped? Mm -hmm. And that and that kind of, um, I, I liked very much the fact that you did not always look at, at play as a positive, fun aspect, but that you actually reminded us that it can be actually a true obstacle course and it can be hellish. And I was also very much reminded of the Botticelli painting uh, Inferno. I yeah. don't know if you remember it because basically it's like these people are in purgatory and basically they're, they're, they're on the way to hell and they're big. Uh, it's um, the punishment is to be in constant movement. Yes. But the, so everybody there is in constant movement, but and actually some of them are playing you know, throwing balls or whatever, running, but even play can be this kind of punishment. So I think there's something about that duality of the space, of the nature of play that's not necessarily positive and it's actually dark and underground. So I think that's the very uh, existential part of play that you've touched on upon. 
another thing you talk about the space of in between and I don't know if you've looked at also another very interesting theorist who've talked about who writes about play is the child psychologist Donald Winnicott and he actually has theorized about the space of in between meaning to be in a space of play in a mental space of play is actually to be in a space of in between because mm -hmm. You're, you're not completely in your mind. So it's not completely in your imagination and it's not completely in the world, but, but it's in that space of in-between that what you do takes time. Like Hoitzinga said, it takes time. It has bearing on your surroundings. I mean, you throw dice. I mean, you, you make movements in real actual space, but it doesn't really have bearing on the real world, really. I mean, you can lose a game, but you're not going to lose your life necessarily. Yeah. So it's that space of in-between that I think also that relates to your choice of that system. So I think that that also really relates and reinforces the notion of play. So I think really I want to commend you for that choice. I'll continue later. Um, to comment on your first note, honestly, it started off as a play being maybe on the positive end. But, uh, but as uh, peers viewed the obstacles that I was presenting, I got all types of all types of emotions, and that confused me. But eventually, I saw that that was the outcome of of the thesis project that I, I discovered later on when people did see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I want to maybe pick up on on a similar. Thread. And I really appreciated when I got to your conclusion, the for, sort of first statement of realized how difficult it is um, to design for play and the ways that you become kind of different players at different moments and ways that you can start to reflect on what architecture is, what the role of architect is, because you're not only, it's not only the player moving through this space you've designed, imagined, it's also the architect you're imagining designing this space who's now following the rules that you as a master's student has come up with. Mm -hmm. And as a master's student, you're following the rules of a university that have decided how you play the game of writing a master's thesis. And kind of the ways at different points you become empowered and you feel in control, but also are subject to these rules that come from one level up. And I'm wondering if you've kind of thought about your position at different moments within this, uh, within writing this and within kind of imagining the people who interact with it. Um, in the sense of uh, setting rules, as in the whole, um, I'm not sure what the question is, if it relates to like my experience writing uh, or working on this. Uh, um, I would, oh, if you want a little bit of clarification, maybe yeah. just uh, this sense of between um, the rules of the game Mm -hmm. and your freedom to play by those rules, who gets to design those rules and whether those people are also following a set of rules. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that's a big question that comes up, whether as in who is the architect and who is not the architect. Um, and that uh, conversation became uh, quite like evident when I was researching and looking into Constance New Babylon in the sense that um, one of the authors, Mark Wigley, had said that everyone is the architect. Meanwhile, Constance New Babylon had already, but Constance had set some rules. So yeah, there is this back and forth and it's difficult to really distinguish who is the architect and who is not, but eventually, um, Eventually, as an architect, I feel like you'd have to set some guidelines or some rules for others to follow. Um, at least as a designer, you have to take a stance on something. Um, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's certainly, certainly architects, uh, I mean, that's how you make decisions, right? As you decide how people are going to move through this space, but also opening up this potential of knowing people aren't going to follow your rules. Yeah. Do you design for that or do you actually just design following your set of rules and let people design their own set of rules within it? And I think yeah. that plays with the idea of whether or not they're just controlling the physical architecture by being able to move spaces around and whether or not they control it by themselves moving through the architecture. Mm -hmm. And I can interject here for a second. I thought it was very, I'm um, 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 advisor. Um, 
Uh, I thought it was very clever on RP's part to select the path, um, the context of path. And Tamar, within the context of path, um, RP chose the Ms. van der Rohe's TD Center. Mm -hmm. And she said one, one line here that the, that the grid of the TD center became her spacing definition. Now, it only not only became spacing definition, it became the ordering principle. So she didn't have, Sarah, she didn't, um, and I don't, I don't know why she's not referring to it, but I watched her organizing her ideas and principles uh, being subordinated to mm -hmm. the ordering principles of TD center. It's not necessarily clearly coming through in uh, overall composition, but every individual component is ruled within that. Um, if you wish, um, if you wish predetermined architectural setting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's very interesting that, uh, that- Happy, why don't you push back to the to TD Center, your image? Sorry, Colin. No, that's okay. I mean, I was I was thinking something similar that um, RP underplayed. I think the the role of the TD center, uh, particularly within the path system, and you know, I, I I think there's a whole other story that could be written here about aspects of play within the work of Mies, mm -hmm. right? The way the way the grid becomes a kind of chessboard for Mies in a way. Um, that's, uh, you know, sometimes it's explicit and sometimes hidden. Yeah. Up it needs another term for that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a really very interesting suggestion to, that I didn't know, I, I didn't realize, I mean, I know you mentioned that it's below the Dominion Center, the Toronto Dominion Center, but had Mies designed actually part of that undergrad All of it. Concord? All of it. All of it. I see. Yeah, I think that's an opportunity. That could have been an opportunity to, especially that your interventions stand in such great contrast to, mm -hmm. to the seriousness of Mies. And I know from a colleague, a colleague of mine at Princeton, when I was writing my dissertation, he was he wrote a paper about the smile of me yes yeah. smile <laughs> smiles and they were rare they were rare you know so in in like photographs so i think to actually put what you came up with as an opposition to uh the the mises uh, seriousness uh, could have be, uh, been an added i not not necessarily should have changed anything in what you designed and proposed but it could actually reinforce what mm -hmm. you did. Mm -hmm. I think there's a very interesting juxtaposition that, you know, in, in my book, I talk about the Eames. And as you know, the Eames did their own house at the same time the, that the Ms. Van der Rohe designed the Farnsworth. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, there's, they are known to have stood very playfully on the frame of their house, posing, as opposed to the really somber a uh, somber silhouette of Mies against the, the Farnsworth, the frame of the Farnsworth. So they were exact contemporaneous uh, pictures. And, you know, one is playful, one is really serious. So I think it's, uh, I agree. I didn't realize that that was, you're right, that that could have even been uh, played up even more. Perhaps also in terms of representation, and I, I'd like perhaps to add something about that. I think, first of all, you know, the, the topic of play is now being picked up in many, many disciplines, sociology and where it started, but also in literature. I mean, many people actually write about the space of play in novels. So really it borders on architecture, but within the, the, you know, comparative literature and literature in general. And what I really appreciate in what you did is that you constantly you do not leave the discipline of architecture in all your explorations, even when you do paintings, even when you collect objects. And I think that's really commendable and beautiful. And I, I really want to commend you for those paintings. I think they're really fantastic and they're inspiring and liberating and, 
and they have a really fantastic place in your work. And, and one, two specific instances uh, appeal to me in your final move. I don't know how you call them, the final playgrounds or the... Uh, <laughs> the design. Uh, yeah. um, and I think those are specifically, I wrote the page that it was on in the, I think it's 163, but uh, I'm not so sure. But basically it's those fears and the, the one that came after uh, at the end, at the very end. And I think um, what is really a great, you know, I think those are successful too, but uh, is that 63 or no, I think, but then you go more in, I think specific, yes, this, this one and the prior page. Uh, yes, this one specifically and the one before it. I think what you, the reason for me, these are especially powerful and also your invention of that sphere that as I understand it is, is floating and can actually turn over. So it's an architecture that actually changes location that you touch not on, you haven't not, you not only have designed a space that is really playful and responds to the moves of its inhabitants, but you also touch on, on questions of representation of architecture and a section and a plan and how a section could become a plan and the whole notion that architecture is actually not uh, mobile, but by the mobility of it, there's a certain, uh, um, you know, ed border that is being blurred between the section and the plan and the possibility of that, that I think uh, for me is powerful because you're touching not, you not only design a space, but you comment on, on means of representation. And, and I think that perhaps you could, in, you know, wherever you go next with this, you could envision addressing representation too in your, uh, when you talk about play in architecture. So not only as the design of the space of play itself, but the, the means of representation, because in the first case studies that you look at, you do not differentiate between uh, Cedric Price uh, it's a visionary architecture on paper and the domino, which is a principle that has been, and, and uh, the, you know, Venturi's hotel that has actually been built. So, but I think the means of representation here really also make a big difference and are uh, really subject to different kinds of rules of play. So I especially want to commend that, that place in your in your uh, thesis, both for the design of it, but also the fact that the design in itself includes a commentary on representation. Well, we have about 10 minutes left. So uh, Scott, we haven't heard anything from you. Well, I'm, I'm so interested in what everyone else has to say. Um, I wanna, well, for sure, thank Harpy for the work um, and the growth in terms of the work. You know, and I just, I just keep thinking, you know, is, does play require a regulating system? Does it require a grid? Um, according to Huzinga, it requires an order in which for the chaos to emerge, I feel like the order comes first, according at least to, to a lot of the um, theorists, the way I saw it. And then even in, and then even while trying out board games and other things, even when the rules are not explicitly set, it feels like there is an order and then in which you manipulate within. Um, so I would say maybe yes. So is it is it kind of a transgression or resistance? I mean, is, is, is play, um, I mean, on one level you sort of think, oh, play is free, but is, is play a battle? Yeah, because then, um, of course, you could also break away from the grid and question the grid and then oppose and impose in another grid. And I feel like Peter Eisenman does that in the sense that he sometimes doesn't create a new rule, removes another rule and so, makes new orders. I, I'm thinking here of my cat. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> because, you know, we play with the cat, right? And we, we have this 
you know, stick with some feathers on the end that we rush around and the cat chases it. But there are very clear rules as to what we're allowed to do with that stick and what we're not, you know, and a very clear order in which the game has to go set by the cat, not set by us, right? Like at a certain point, the, the, the feathers have to go underneath the pillow so that we can chase under and then they have to rush up against the concrete wall and he'll climb up and so on. Um, so it seems to me that maybe it's not so much that there has to be rules or there has to be a grid in order for the game to happen, but maybe it's more like the, the game simultaneously creates the grid or creates the rules. The boundaries. And so the boundaries, the rules and so on. So, so maybe the, the way in this, in which this is a resistance, Scott, is that it's a questioning of what those rules should be and of the production of new rules. And I but think I also think that it's, that it's not only a question of setting up um, the game. RP is not actually designing the games. RP right. is talking about architecture for play. And uh, if architecture for play doesn't have ordering system or rules, then architecture becomes a game rather than accommodating or rather than, um, so to speak, enhancing the game. I think the role of architecture and the play is well defined by RP. And I think that's the strength of her thesis. Um, if she removed the architectural constraints from her dis discourse on the play, which is purely, um, defined by behavioral patterns. I think her thesis would have lost the architectural rigor that it has. And I think that's maybe what I was questioning at the start of like these different levels of this um, and where rules come in, who sets those rules. And I think maybe at the end you get to a play space that people get to play and that the rules are no longer there, but rules have informed creating or that the game is the rules you've created for the architect. The architect plays the game, and then that creates this space that now players can play, and that there is a difference between play, this kind of free play we imagine, and playing a game, and where the kind of lines between that emerge throughout your process working through this, this project. Half mm -hmm. of our time was spent on the difference between playing and playing a game. <laughs> right, Arby? I think one of the one of the ways to to read that, I mean, coming back to Scott's idea about transgression and so forth, I often was asking myself this about the the the, the way you were defining play in the process of the, the thesis, um, because I kept coming back to the idea that somehow play was sub, could be or should be subversive in some way, and that did come into some of your earlier discussions about disrupting the normal behavior of people in the path, especially given that it is such a kind of uh, you know especially the, the area you dealt with, which is right at Keegan Bay, which is this kind of corporate headquarters. And this was throwing a kind of wrench into the normal flow of things. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's without rules, right? One, one way to be subversive is to propose alternative rules to what are the normative rules, um, thereby, in a sense, revealing the arbitrary nature of those rules. Those rules aren't, you know, absolute. We've invented them, we've created them, and we are free to change them. Um, and by proposing an alternative to what's already there, not to say it is without rules, but it's to reveal the fact that we can make up our rules and change them and vary them um, and still have an ordered universe, <laughs> but it's a different order that we're dealing with. And I think that's part of what, I think that's part of how I'm reading your, your project, that by, by shifting the rules rather than by throwing them out altogether, you, you reveal the the flexibility that we sometimes assume is not there. And I think, I think the choice of Mies is, is particularly useful in that sense, because, you know, again, he's this kind of iconic figure. Um, maybe he does smile from time to time, right? <laughs> I think maybe the, the other subversions that I'm curious about, especially given the, the situ situationalist starting point you bring in and their critique, um, and then wondering if you've kind of subverted the world, the modernist world that they've critiqued in order to reintroduce play, 
but also kind of you bring in this neoliberal critique, which says, and then the system will adapt to those rules and reintegrate it and find a way to subvert that and make that part of its own system. So ways that you could imagine this broader system now seeing your space and turning it into work, right? And mm -hmm. um, so if now when I push something down through the sand, is there an electricity thing that harnesses that energy and I feed, and now I'm powering mm -hmm. the TV towers, right? And so this kind of constant play and the need for play to be able to constantly remaneuver. So how long could this installation last before it gets subverted or how flexible it is to then respond back to that system that keeps wanting to pull itself into it? Yeah. I think also in terms of subversions and uh, I, um, it would have been perhaps even more beneficial to, to think of more than one user at once. I think as I was going through your spaces, I imagined one person until I got to that sphere that perhaps people kind of battle each other. I, I like the relation of war and battle uh, association. You know that uh, Hoitzinga does have a chapter about war and play and how they are in fact related. Mm -hmm. War, ne ne some wars like duels, imagine duels. I mean, they also necessitate order and uh, a lot of the same rules apply to war as apply to, to games. But uh, also it reminds me, and the, and the relation to Mies is very interesting because again, it reminds me of that period in the early 50s, which is actually the time that Hoitzinger was translated to English, you know, it was only mm -hmm. translated in 51. So it was only read by those architects in 51 in the States, it's not in 38 when it was written. So um, there's a very interesting poem actually that Miss van der Rohe wrote. I mean, it's kind of written in a sort of a poem in 1951 and it was published actually with a picture of Eames chairs. But it says that he thought that Architecture is not a playground. And again, it's very nice. Our architecture is a battleground of the spirits and it's not a playground for the senses. And it's actually very nice to go against him, you know? <laughs> I mean, can you, and in a way you prove it, uh, you go against him. And, and it's also a battle with Mies, you know, which in that sense, it's very very nice and other other people have taken him on i mean you know like smithsons also have taken me on in terms of like a creator battle with his sayings but i think in i think in that sense uh, you've you've reinvigorating this this um uh, these questions with i think your new input and again i i think your creative the creative part of your your paintings your collections have a lot of uh value and I think it's really uh, you can even write more about them and continue them I think that this is really very enriching part of your investigation okay well I'm, I'm we're on our time limit but if anybody has any last comments before we before we leave off um, I just want to say thank you RP for the process and for these <laughs> incredible images at the end I'm just astounded. <laughs> and I would um, like, and I would like to comment on uh, working with RP as a process. And I must say that um, she's probably one of the most dynamic, the most creative, and the most self-disciplined people I worked in the last twenty plus years. And uh, to her, um, just to her credibility. Her computer crashed and her latest design was totally destroyed three weeks prior to presentation. And I was sure we're going for August. I was sure. No, she rebuilt everything from scratch, not everything from scratch, but the last part of her presentation wow. within two weeks. And and I thought, you know, what a what a steel core she has. <laughs> she did not deviate from, from her direction. No. RP, I learned from you a lot. It was a discovery. Um, and I know it was a discovery. It was a huge discovery for you. But I must say that I was watching you discovering this path and learned a lot from you. A lot of things which um, I think would be very, very um, 
helpful if you shared it in describing the process of, um, so to speak, self-criticism, self, um, you, you were giving crits to yourself. You did not really need so much the external um, force, but you responded to external, external guidance very well. So commend you and thank you for the, for the very enlightened and lightening process. Okay. Very good. It was very beautiful to yeah. see and read. Well, thank you, thank Arpia. You. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Tamara. It was wonderful criticism. Hi, Sarah. Thank you for your for your questions okay. because I think I think RP needed these questions. And okay, so RP, I'm going to ask you to leave the room, okay. and if we can stop.